Right, guys, we are on live now. <laughs> okay, wow. Hello. One more minute. Nah, uh, one more minute. You're counting, okay. right? Counting. You're counting. Yeah, yeah. we're counting already. Nine, eight, seven, six, <laughs> five, four, three, three two. two. Oh, yeah, live. All right. So now we will start our session today. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our very first episode of Alumni Talk. This Alumni Talk is brought to you by PIDC Virtual Circle. This show is entitled as Alumni Rendezvous, which we will have some chit chat session with our beloved alumni. So I'm your host today, Zusin, and together hosting with me is my co-host, Kok Hao. Hi, everyone. I'm Kok Hao. Yeah, it's me again. And today, we are going to have a little bit of chit-chat with our respected alumni. Before we start, I would like to introduce them to everyone. First, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Harati Dryraja. She's our alumni from Batch 6, and she's currently working as dental officer at Klinik Pergigian Jala Angsana. And before I forget, she's also the winner of Miss Malaysia Indian Global for year 2015. Next, we have uh, together with us, Dr. Zeso Samson Eko. Uh, he's currently working in Dental Sabah HQ, or you can, you can say as Penjabat Timbalan Pengarah Kesehatan Negeri Sabah. Also, he has been selected as liaison officer for a major event, My APEC, for year 2020. Let us welcome our alumni. Hi, morning, doctors. Morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Right. Dr. Hati and Dr. Jessel, welcome to our Facebook Live today. Okay, so right, yeah. we will... before we start, I would like to encourage the, the audience, if you have any questions, please don't feel shy. It's a, it's a very good chance for you to clear your doubts. Our alumni are very experienced. They are seasoned dentists. They have been practiced in KKM for many years. So don't be shy. Just ask your questions. You want to yes, ask in English? Very experienced. I can translate for you. Okay. So, Zusin, we would like to start our discussion today. Yes. So, as we can see now, the COVID-19 pandemic has made a lot of change in our world, including in the dental field. So, Dr. Harati, in your opinion, how has the pandemic changed the practice of dentistry? Uh, hi. Hi, everyone. First of all, good morning. <laughs> Thanks for giving us a chance to be here and share our thoughts today. Uh, yes. Uh, during uh, the pandemic, uh, which is also currently ongoing, there have been many changes. You see uh, the changes that's been made previously, uh, before the pandemic, of course, whenever uh, patients come into our dental treatment, treatment would be given uh, readily for them whenever available. But right now, uh, there are many SOPs and uh, other precautions that have been done to actually prevent the spread of COVID-19. Uh, among those are actually uh, currently in practice right now, all patients have to make appointments before they attend our dental clinic. And these appointments are uh, easy to be done. All you have to do is call or uh, in Jessel's place in Sarawak, they actually have their online appointment-based uh, website and everything. Uh, as for us here, other than uh, with, uh, I mean, other than appointments, of course, uh, whenever the patient enters a clinic, uh, they have to follow the uh, standard procedures like taking your temperature, scanning your mycejatra, and then, uh, of course, sanitizing your hand and wearing a mask before you enter. And once they are in, of course, the us, the dentists and everything, we are off, uh, always equipped with our personal protective equipment. We're always wearing our Tyrex face shield and everything. Tyrex is yeah, what you call your like astronaut a, astronaut really suit. Like yes, shield, <laughs> it's really hot in there. <laughs> yeah, but once you get used to it, uh, then yeah, you you'll be fine doing patience. Uh, other than that, actually, right now, uh, I mean, during the pandemic, uh, they have this innovation which actually came up with an aerosol containing box. So those of your graduates, uh, new, new, newly graduated students, if you guys are into like creativity and innovating things, you can actually join this team and come up with a lot of amazing ideas to, uh, you know, to be presented, to be ex executed. So we've used the uh, aerosol containing box and things like that uh, during the pandemic to prevent cross-infection among dentists and also patients. So these are just uh, some of it. I think um, maybe Dr. Jessel, you can yeah. uh, 
continue. Um, uh, I'll add on. Uh, first of all, first of all, good morning. Uh, can morning. You just hear me? Okay. Uh, good morning. Salam sejahtera and kopi bosian. That's how we say it in my Kadazan language uh, to the hosts, Kakao and Zishin, and to all the viewers out there. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this sharing session. And about the changes, changes during the pandemic, uh, actually, um, there's not, uh, there's not, not a lot of changes, you know, because, uh, okay, for infection controls, I, I mean, uh, in our settings, our clinical settings, we are very, very emphasized on um, uh, following the strict infection control because every every month or let's say maybe twice a twice a year we are having uh, audits audits in the clinic for to see if we are following the correct uh, infection control and also previously last time uh, if i may add last year uh, year 2020 uh, our government clinic clinic pergigian kerajaan uh, only uh, treating or accepting emergency cases such as uh, toothache with a pain score of more than four, uh, gum swelling, facial swelling, complications, mm -hmm. and uh, dislodged from socket. And what about what about the other procedures such as filling, um, dentures, root canal treatments? And now we uh, no need to worry because, like what as uh, Dr. Harati mentioned, is now we are. Using, we are wearing all this PPE, and also in addition to that, we are having extra, extra machines or extra assets in our dental cl clinic setting. Uh, for example, EOVS, the extra oral volume suction, vacuum suction, and also the air disinfectant unit, which is uh, being used during the uh, aerosol generating procedure, so as to eliminate all the um, air, aerosol air droplets in, in the air. Yeah, so that's about the our situation in in the dental clinic lah, in the surgery room. Uh -huh. What about the in in from the aspect of the patients? Have we seen any changes for for the patient who came and seek treatment? Because I believe until now there are still a lot of people having the misconception that during the MCO CMCO situation we can only go for a clinic when we have some emergency for dental clinic. So, in terms of patient flow, is there anything changes? All right, I, uh, I think I can add this. So, um, during the MCO, what happens is uh, they've actually restricted the treatment to, uh, to only emergency dental care. So, when you say emergency dental care, according to the guideline by uh, KKM, it means a pain score more than four, and then a broken dentures, dislodged crown, dislodged restorations, a cancer, uh, and uh, of course, acute infection like abscess or facial cellulitis, all these kind of things are emergency. Definitely, at that moment during the MCO, we will take in these kind of cases immediately. But uh, other cases, maybe like regular scaling or your regular checkup and all, those were uh, uh, these people were actually given an appointment, or we would actually follow up back with them after the MCO period. And as for uh, after the MCO, right, uh, during the CMCO, RMCO, and uh, things like that. So uh, the uh, what do you call that? The SOPs change accordingly to the situation, to the number of cases as well, number of COVID nineteen cases as well. So right now, we're uh, in the clinics. We are accepting. Uh, all kind of cases, everything is back, almost back to normal, even aerosol generating procedures like your filling, your scaling, uh, all these kind of things are back in the clinics. Uh, but patient has to take uh, appointment when they come in. So like in my clinic, we have five chairs, two, two chairs are designated for outpatients and also uh, immediate treatment. And then two more chairs are actually for aerosol generating procedures. And then we have another one more chair for dentures and also root canal procedures. So uh, basically everybody gets a chance to come in almost every day and get their dental treatment done. So as for the number of patients that are coming in, yes, it is slowly increasing day by day. Yes. Okay, for, for, the, situation, for the situation in Sabah, okay, um, just to share, um, the dental clinics or the dental facilities in Sabah, there are only 40, 40 dental clinics, um, dental facility in the state of Sabah. So with that figure, with that data, 
uh, all the patients and all the waiting lists during the COVID-19 pandemic are all pushed to the back, which means we are having about six months of waiting list. So six to six months in Sabah. So to reduce that one, now we are accepting patients on a daily basis. But then it's only restricted to uh, only eight to 12 or more or less for per dental surgery room. So in that case, all, each patient, we are only giving, we are, we are only treating like 30 minutes. So in the 30 minutes, we uh, try to uh, try to treat all those all those cases, all the urgent cases, so that uh, so that we can reduce the emergency cases in the future, lah. And also, um, there are other steps taken by this by us, uh, whereby we are opening after office hours, after office office hours, which means after five, and also during the weekends to reduce the waiting list, the long waiting list, so as to. Uh, cover all the all the all the appointment patients during the during the year 2020 yeah that's the condition in Sabah. I, i'd like to add something uh mm -hmm. just like jessel said you know they work after office hours in penang we actually have utc yeah so the utc there is a dental clinic there that actually does uh patients after after five as well okay yeah that's to manage the patient flow and to give people treatment when they need it uh at night yeah, then I have one question. Do the yes. dentists they get OT payment? Uh no, they actually work <laughs> shifts. Yes. They got night shifts and uh day shift. They do shifts. Yeah. Mm. So they work about the same hours as us. Yeah, shift so, means we need to say you, you come at work at uh, 12 or 2 and then you push towards uh, towards after uh, oh, so that means nine hours of working up. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I was hoping that we can get some OT if we like work extra hour, you know. <laughs> if you do on and, call in the hospital, you'll get that. Oh, on call. Okay. Uh, we have our first question from the audience coming up from Brian Chong. What's the meaning of aerosol generating procedure? Dr. Zessel, can you clear the doubts for us? Okay, this one right for uh, aerosol generating procedures are all the uh, dental treatments or any treatments that involve involving um producing of aerosols such as uh, obviously scaling, uh, full mouth scaling and also fillings. Because those um, uh, with these procedures, all the aerosols will be flying here and there. We can't see it, but then we can feel it. That's why um, uh, for these treatments we are using, uh, it's good to have uh, this extra, I mean the extra assets to help, help to reduce and clean our air in our surgery room yeah so that's where the the filter comes into play right the yes. like yeah, for our right. college we use the hepa filter to suck out all the aerosol when we when we're doing the procedure so doctor uh, i want to ask from your experience have you came across any cases where dentists are involved in active uh how to say they get infected after they treat the patient so far yeah okay um all right. So uh, according to uh, KKM, uh, they've did the they've have the data about uh, by November 2020 last year there were about 15 dental personnel who have contracted the disease. But it's not due to uh, dental procedures. It's actually due to uh, it can be a source from uh, other places. Community. Maybe when they go out. Yes, from the community. So uh, that's uh, basically it. Lah. Not uh, definitely not from dental procedures. So I guess our PPEs and our SOPs are working pretty well. And everything. Mm -hmm. That means the dentists are considered kind of relatively safer compared to other other profession. Is it? No, yeah. actually, our no, our safe. risks are higher. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I guess yeah. with the precautions, it helps uh, a lot. So yeah. that's yeah. what we're yeah. practicing it. Yeah, even even during your even during students, your lecturers and also your assistants will keep on emphasizing, you know, disinfecting your your all your SOP, all this one, this and that. Because I'm sure when you go to the government setting, it will be more more strict. Because more strict. yeah, because when you're in the in the government setting, you are on your own. There are no lecturers, there are no uh, assistants to to tell you that is not correct. This everything on yourself. Everything is you're on your own. own. Yeah, yeah, so, so I, I we can, can 
Yes. We can see from the uh, doctor sharing that uh, the precaution made for the dentist and the healthcare professional itself is very, very safe and very complete. How about for the patient when they walk into the clinic? Do they have to take any SOP or wear any PPE to protect themselves? Okay, for this one, I answer. For patients who are visiting the dental clinic, they should always wear face masks. Okay, mm -hmm. face mask is the most important thing. That's the barrier between yourself and you and me. Okay, and also when you go to during the registration, there are a few uh, dental staff there will be taking your history. You you are required to scan your mycelia, uh, taking your temperatures, and also they will ask few questions uh, regarding about yourself, lah. Uh, where have you been for the past fourteen years? Where have you traveled here and there? So please. During this time, answer, please answer um, correctly. Don't and don't yeah. try to hide something like, from us because if you hide something, all of us are affected. And um, the consequences, the whole clinic or the whole dental clinic will be closed for disinfectant, disinfecting procedures. And also ourselves will be asked to do swab test or quarantine to prevent or to help the spread of possible infections. So, like, one thing I feel about the changes before and after the MCO is, nowadays, if I go out without wearing a mask, I feel unpleasant, you know. I feel I'm naked if I don't wear my mask. Even now, also, I feel weird because, like, I'm seeing everyone's face without a mask on it. So, doctors, do you have anything to tell to those people who don't wear their mask properly? Yeah, I see like Dr. Harati like got something to share about this. <laughs> yes, I, I do actually. So for those who are actually not wearing their mask, I mean, there are, uh, there, there's a right way to wear it. You always have to cover your nose and your mouth. Okay, don't leave it hanging when you're taking your food. Don't leave it at your chin and things like that. If you're going to uh, remove your mask, you have to remove it and keep it in a, a proper uh, storage place, which uh, usually uh, restaurants, they give you like plastic bag, right, to keep it in. Or paper bags to keep it in so that's a very clean uh, sanitized way to keep your mask and then of course do not reuse your mask because uh, there's no sale on masks for you to buy more <laughs> so yes mask should be changed uh, of course uh, daily actually yeah you cannot you cannot wear the mask repeatedly and uh, for those who want to wear um, uh, masks of uh, masks made by cloth those reusable ones you need to wash them dry them under the sun and then only wear them back all right so th these are some some tips that people should uh, follow and of course to prevent mass ac acne as well yeah i have seen a lot of my seniors they are having the mass acne and things on their face and this is a good reason we should keep our mask on <laughs> okay. yes basically so, mass is a part yeah. of us already now yeah, yeah. yeah. Mask is a part of us <laughs> yes. so now this is the you know you know man, mm -hmm. like um, going outside, you're not wearing, you're not wearing a mask. It's like you're feeling naked. That's like what you say. That's not. Yeah. And also, please wear your mask properly. Wear your mask properly. Don't wear underneath your nose. Don't put it on your under underneath your chin. Yeah. Because all these are the, the proper SOP of wearing masks. Because last time I can say during my student time, during my uh, uh, first year. Every time when I'm done treating patient, when I talk to the patient, I will put my mask down under the chair and talk to the patient. But then uh, that is not the right procedure already now for during this pandemic time. <laughs> so yep. yeah, it's much important now. And also because we are dentists, we are like somewhat related to healthcare, the, the field. So we are very much particular about mask wearing. If I walk on the street, I see someone don't wear their mask properly. I have the, you know, I have the urge to go and, you know, the Gordon or something like that. <laughs> okay, I think this thing you got something you want to you want to ask, right? Yeah, uh, because I've heard that Dr. Harati, you have personal experience got infected with COVID-19. Uh, can you share with us about your experience? Okay, sure. Uh, I'll, I'll share the short version of it. So on, uh, yes, I was infected by uh, COVID-19. It was on the 12th of November when I found out. I was actually uh, planning to go back uh, to my hometown. And at that 
a time out of prudence because we were very active in the swabbing team and volunteering around Penang. So what I did was I told my friend, hey, maybe can I schedule just a swab session? Uh, plus, I just want to feel how it is like to get something up my nose. And I went, got my PCR test done, and the following day it came out positive. So once a PCR test comes out positive, so basically there's no arguing about it. It's the most accurate test. So you straight away get admitted. At that time, you get admitted to the hospital for isolation. In uh, my situation, I did not have any symptoms. I was an asymptomatic patient. So if you see in this country, about um, 80 to 90% of the patients are asymptomatic. Most of them don't know. They only find out after contact tracing or by chance, random, random sampling like that. All right. Mm -hmm. So what happens in the hospital is, uh, it's very interesting. Once you enter the hospital, you don't get to go out. You go into your room. And it's a one way into your room and you can never come out until it's 10 days. So that I wasn't quite prepared scary, for that. Doctor. Yeah, I thought I could walk around and things like that. But no, you go in straight. You sit there for 10 days. There is no medication. And when doctors talk to you, most of the time it's through WhatsApp. So to minimize the interaction on the contact between patient and doctors, to minimize cross-infection. And so basically, uh, when you talk about treatment for COVID-19, there's nothing. You only give symptomatic relief. Let's say the patient has a fever, you give them PCM. If they're having a muscle ache, you give them an analgesic. Uh, if they have uh, difficulty breathing, maybe a bronchodilator or something like this. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's all. So basically, I spent 10 days inside there. The only thing you might feel that's a bit stressful is your mental health because uh, you tend to read a lot of things and a lot of people tell you a lot of things when you are in there. So, um, yeah, so, but I found like a really good uh, routine to do my exercise and do my writing and reading and everything. So that kept me occupied. And I think if people are in, on, uh, in quarantine, I think they should develop a very healthy routine so that, you know, they wouldn't feel down and everything like that. So for me, the quarantine was not bad. It was bearable. It was okay. Wow, Dr. Adi, uh, you are very you have a very strong mind. For me, I think I will just slap the 10 days off. <laughs> and also, uh, doctor, in case like let's say I'm suspecting I might have the disease, is there any any places or any contact I can call for inquiries? Yeah, sure. Actually, uh in Malaysia, uh we have the CPRC, the Crisis Preparedness Response Center. So the CPRC uh, team was actually uh, 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 it was founded during the ninth Malaysia plan and basically they deal with uh, disaster uh, pandemics this kind of thing emergencies and all so uh, the, there is a number uh, this is uh, actually a whole of Malaysia number so you can call the zero three triple eight one zero two hundred number uh, if you have any questions or if you think you need to get tested or anything like that. Other than that, you can also call up your uh, district office, your health district office. Like a, like in Penang, I'm at Timor Laut district. So you have to call up. Uh, of course, dental offices, we have a number to the district office. You can just Google that and then they will help you out. Hmm. Okay. I think, uh, I... Jessel, what about your place in Sarawak? Yes, um, uh, I'm in Sabah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so just to add on, uh, for if you do get an encounter with any of the cases, or you you, you know that you are close contact, close contact to COVID nineteen cases, and you do, you do not know who to contact, just call your local CPRC. You can just uh, Google it, or if you're having symptoms, uh, let's say shortness of breath, uh, you can straight away call your hospital or just dial 999 and mention that you have close contact to a positive case and you're having difficulty in breathing they will surely will entertain and will uh, send an ambulance to to your place and to to get things done yeah so that's the, the fastest the fastest way yeah so we, we, i can see there's a lot of question coming on from the from the audience there's a really long i think there's an essay typed out by cha singh <laughs> I'm putting it on the screen now. A right, good session. Are there any Malaysian data on the percentage of COVID transmission among dentists or patients in the government facilities? Uh, I think. So Dr. maybe Hardy, we can we'll answer continue. one by one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, one by one. Okay, are there any Malaysian data on the percentage of COVID transmission among dentists? Right, I do okay. 
Yeah. So uh, for this uh, question, uh, there are no percentage on the transmission among dentists and patients because so far the the cases that they have they have so far unrelated to dental practices. They're actually related to the community. So for that, we do not have any data, but they do have the numbers of patient uh, dental, not dental officers, dental personnel. Dental so basically, staff. yeah, staff. So it can be dental officer or it can be a, a technician or anything like that. But so far, the number as to November 2020 is only 15 people. Uh, but the current numbers, uh, we haven't gotten any data yet on that. Mm -hmm. All right, that's for the first question. And um, let's the see second the next question. Yeah, it's about if government is pushing back patients due to the COVID scare, does that translate into higher referrals to the private clinics? Okay, for this one, I'll answer for this one. Okay, for this one, for this situation in Sabah, uh, we are not um, telling patients directly not to come to us or we are not accepting them. them. We still accept them, but then we are giving appointment because we try to catch up all the all the six all the waiting list, all the six months plus waiting list. We are we try to cover them, so uh, it's not the first time for spaces. We basically uh, those who came earlier, who got their appointments earlier, we will treat them, and also uh, those um, who came to us later, we will still treat them, but then maybe need to wait for a little while, lah. But then it's uh, on your own if you cannot wait for for that one some people they prefer go to direct to private clinics we 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 didn't refer them to private clinics but then they it's on on their own on self lah. yes um in, yeah yeah i agree with jessel so basically uh we do not refer uh patients to uh, private clinics all patients are given appointment accordingly and of course the emergency ones are treated first so if patient uh, move on to private clinics i think it's most likely related to the uh, uh time the the waiting time maybe they're impatient they want to get things done uh, earlier mm -hmm. things like that then uh, i think they themselves would uh, move so maybe in the private clinics it, it in a way probably they would get a little bit more patient there but yeah that, that's a then for the for the last part, uh, private clinic practicing the SOP, I think the answer is yes, obviously. Uh, so and also Mr. Carson asked if there is no difference between the transmission rate, maybe there is a need to relook and to ensure the needies needy to get their treatment. So what do you have to say about this, Dr. Zesso? So yeah, Dr. Carson, thank you for your question. For this one, yeah, we will try to uh ensure the DD gets their tra treatment we will try to um not to refer we'll try our best to to get them to get the treatments done in our uh, government setting so that they don't need to spend more uh, visiting or getting their treatments done in the private clinic right? so we maybe we can just like we said just now we can treat them after after office hours or during the uh, weekends because i'm sure we when we try to do we giving appointments during the weekends or after uh, office hours some they can't make it so we will put this patient those who can make it at this time um to get their treatments treatments done yeah so just you try to to, uh, to cover all of our of our people yeah okay. Thanks thank for you answer, doctor for the sharing uh, we still got a lot of questions coming in, so yeah. maybe before we move on with our next, uh, with our discussion, shall we address their questions? So we have the next one. Yeah, from the question Ronald, from we... yeah. Yeah, the thing we please. Yes. Hello, Doctor Jessel Draco, Samsung Eco. Could you share what is your best encounter of dental patient? Um. Okay, for this one, how to say? I, I think there are a lot, a lot of experience. But then, just to share, um, just um, before I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the dental headquarters. I was previously posted in Clinic Pagigian Nabawan, which is situated in the rural part of Tanjungau. So when I was there. And together with my colleague, Dr. Joshua K, 
uh, we have seen a lot of funny cases and being the only dental officers and also the dental clinics which is about um, seven kilometers away from the main clinic in Keningau and 100 to 200 kilometers um, away from Kota Kinabalu. So all the funny cases like uh, on-call cases, uh, accidents or get uh, attacked by bears and get stung by uh, snakes, all this we are uh, experiencing firsthand. Uh, and those like uh, fell down, fell down from from rambutan tree, try to try to get their fruits, and also uh, get shot, get shot by the illegal illegal guns during during hunting, during the wild boar or the bakas hunting. So all this uh, we experienced, I experienced it myself during my posting in the uh, in Abawan lah, in Abawan and covering Pensiangan and Pagalungan areas. All this we are we need to to go through all the gravel roads and also by boats to reach to this area. So yeah, that's a good good experience or good cases if you have to see more more of these cases go to the rural areas. Yeah, speaking of which, I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's very interesting if we can know more about your uh, doctor's working experience in the KKM. So shall we move on to the next uh, next discussion for today, which is the expect the unexpected work-life balance and also uh, for the audience don't be don't worry we are going to address your questions one by one all right so what do you have to share with us for Dr. Zesso because I heard you've been uh, practicing in some rural area I heard that you've got a lot of interesting experience you can share to the audience okay for for Sabah I'll share particularly to Sabah and Sarawak uh, as we all know our Geographical uh, settings, uh, our geographical areas, yeah, far apart, not far. Apart. We're having, um, we're having all the hilly, hilly, hilly sides and all the um, roads that is not accessible by by cars, and we only can hike. So um, when you uh, get posted in Sabah, you can expect to go to the this to these areas by uh, helicopters, uh, which is we call the flying doctor service. I've been there, so um, we need, we get on this helicopter and bring with all our our dental equipments to give treatments to those in the in the kampung area. Lah. And so not only that, um, during the 2016, when the flying doctor service was stopped uh, for a while due to some problems, uh i assemble assemble a dental team to to go to the rural part of uh, sabah where we hike for for two days with our dental equipments and giving treatments to those staying in this particular kampung which is near to the border of indonesia wow. so yeah as you can see in the photos we are uh hiking you can see my big bag with all my personal my personal stuff and also our some of our dental equipments where we bring we brought our uh dental forceps our la our um, distilled water to do this uh disinfection so yeah then this one we are giving their school a uh, scholar in the, the primary school we are giving talks to them and because yeah uh, we didn't left out anyone. We are covering those all these uh, kids, school kids, in mostly in the rural areas. So as you can go on, you can see how how we we giving them. Uh, we taught them how to brush their teeth and can go for next photo. Okay, this is how this is how we traveled in the before we start with our uh, free massage chair where we all the gravel gravel roads. Oh. So as you can see, uh, this is where we hike for at least one day to reach from one village to another village. So we rest one day in one village before we continue our journey to the border of Indonesia because uh, that kampung is still under Sabah. Those staying there are still Sabahan, still Malaysians, they're having IC. So it's, it is, um, uh, we, 
it's not good and not getting any treatment just because the flying doctor service they've been stopped for for some time so yeah can you see they are giving uh, uh giving treatments or giving la so we have a yeah this is by next next photo traveling by boats and of course with the with our instruments our heavy instruments Can <laughs> yeah and this is we we need to pass pass by all the rivers all this you can see the crystal clear water this is like wow. a commando commando training already <laughs> so your wow. fitness test if you are in Saba, your fitness test is tested lah so yeah this one we, we went we went into this kampung we went to this village together with the kesihatan so as um there are uh, more of us working together so we, we will not get lost and yeah lah, we are working together with the medical and medical side so that we are giving uh, not only dental treatments but also uh, medical treatments to to those staying in in this area in rural area hmm. so yeah this is uh, some sharing when you uh, get posted to saba and can get a different different types of experience lah i can say different types so yeah, these are my assistants our driver where we pack up and travel before we start our our two days hike <laughs> doctor i think that is um some experience they're so they're so good it's very i think you can be very proud when you share with your with with your child later on sure sure like, sure yeah this so, is and also this is yeah, getting, what, what to share mm. yeah See? ah this is the i think this one is on the helicopter this is during the, he, this is during the helicopter helicopter uh, flying doctor service to Kampung Longkogungan in Penampang. When you mention Penampang, Penampang is it itself is already in the KK area. But then uh, mm -hmm. I can say that some part of Penampang are still in in the rural areas. Means uh, it is not accessible, not easily accessible by uh, by cars. So to get there, we need to hike. So for this one, to reduce the hike, to reduce the time, we we are using the a helicopter which is annoying, about uh, 20 to 30 minutes of travel instead of one day traveling to this particular kampung mm. so this ah. is uh, the uh, uh, step of Saba Saba health step uh, uh, initiative to help those in, in the interiors interior part of Saba lah. wow so doctor I think it's only for when we are servicing for the KKM we will get involved in this kind of projects so i have received quite some some opinion from seniors like whenever they choose for their posting they will try to choose for the man city but if in case they don't get to choose whatever they wanted do you have any like advice for them for our senior who just got their posting yeah dr zeso um sorry can you repeat the question i, I my line was stuck halfway just now. oh okay okay Means, sorry, can uh, you repeat the some, question please yeah for those uh senior for those who just got their posting if they cannot get whatever stay or what location they want do you have any advice for them is it really that bad if they got posted to some rural area okay for this one uh based on my personal experience just go for it because okay the experience uh, the cases that you are seeing in clinics are uh, different from those in uh, main the main city as well as the those in the rural areas in the main city you are, you are seeing cases too but then it's not as interesting as those in the in the rural areas so uh, for during for your for those who just graduated and you are entering the NDOC program, which is uh, initiative. Uh, this, this is a program which is uh, replacing ours. Ours last time, ours is FIDO, first year dental officer. Now the latest one is NDOCs. <laughs> so uh, you need to fight for your for your place in the e dentist system. Whereas you need to log in into the system, into the email. So you need to choose your place. Just so if you're a bit late. Or the your the place uh, you're looking into already get uh, occupied. You need to look to other place. So when you get 
Sabah, or you already set your mind you need to get Sabah. Sabah is not only KK, it's not only Sandakan, not only Tawau. Keningau, uh, Kudat, also it's, all, of, all of these places are having dental clinics and they are rural areas. So if you want to learn more, you need to get more cases, go for the rural areas. Because uh, you need to, you don't need to fight for your slots, for your appointments, because as you're at the end of, you need to, uh, you need to fulfill your quotas to reach the to reach your minimum requirements lah, so that you get absorbed into the service. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, doctor, let us look at our audience questions from Nolan Krishna. He say, "Hi, doctor." What are your advice for students finding it a challenge in their clinical years due to pandemic? I think this question is kind of similar with Vinoven Kuna, Vinoven Kuna's questions, which is something about uh, dental or health personnel stress level, burnout, and etc. So, Doctor, do you have anything to share for us? Maybe Dr. Uh, Hariti? Okay. So, uh, let's start with Nolan's question. Hi, Doctor. What are your advice for students finding it a challenge in clinical years due to pandemic? All right. So, uh, hi, Nolan. Uh, basically, uh, I, I need to know what kind of challenges uh, you are facing first to answer this question. But uh, let's say um, you guys are finding it uh, hard to do certain procedures and stuff like that or get patients and all. So, I, I think uh, in that manner, what we can do is uh, maybe perhaps you guys can arrange appointments to for patients to come at a regular basis so that you guys can, you know, uh, perform certain type of procedures and things like that. But other than that, uh, I think during the pandemic, uh, a lot of people have to be very fluid. You know, if you can't uh, uh, take part in clinical, uh, I mean, uh, procedures and things like that, then perhaps you guys can uh, shift your interest to uh, innovations and things like this. Because during the pandemic, of course, a lot we were actually lacking of PPEs and uh, mm -hmm. our, especially our face shield and all, you know, we weren't getting... Uh, uh, proper supply at the beginning of the pandemic when the case were really, cases were really high. So uh, in KKM, what happened was uh, all these staff nurses and doctors, uh, what they did was because pain should be have uh, halted the treatment, AGP treatments, mm -hmm. they had some free time. So they all worked together. They came together to invent different kind of face shield. Uh, they invented uh, aerosol boxes, these kind of things, you know. So basically, it's using uh, all the knowledge that you have you read up more on the disease itself and then try and, you know, use that knowledge to come up with new or different things. Other than, um, your, I mean, let's say you're finding challenges in the clinical years. Uh, of course, you can also shift uh, towards digitalization of a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, a lot of your lectures and things like this, like what uh, Kokao and Zishin are doing right now. This is uh, a form of uh, digitalizing uh, awareness, you know. Uh, before this, before the pandemic, we don't do all this, correct? We usually uh, do upfront talks and things like that. But after the pandemic, it has opened like a vast range of opportunities for people to actually use technology. And I think uh, that is what, uh, Nolan, perhaps you can actually uh, skew towards that side and then develop your other skills in other uh, aspects. Yeah. All right. And Dr. Zeso, I think you'll be interested to, to look at this comment from Desmond Yap. Lot of the rings, <laughs> dental team team. <laughs> Is this something yeah. that you experienced? This? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this one, just uh, just our joke. Because I work together with uh, Dr. Desmond in, in the rural part of Sabah. Because I was in number one. Uh, he was in... Uh, so clinic so which is only 15 to 20 minutes away our clinics but then we are separated by a by a hill by a high hill oh, <laughs> so that's yeah. where the lot of the ring parts comes in <laughs> la. yeah that's the area <laughs> <They're just sick. laughs> okay so uh also doctors i want to ask about the structure of kkm like when we uh, get a job as endo the new dental officer is there anything we need to pay extra precaution, extra care to, like don't ever mess with your dental surgery assistant? Uh, do you have any things to share to our senior who just got their posting? Maybe to okay, allow them I, to survive for their first week? I'll start, like, I'll start because uh, when I... 
uh, Central Headquarters, I've been receiving a lot of calls from those from Semenanjung. Lah. They are all most of them asking me to place them as they ask if they can get posted in KK, Kota Kinabalu, if they want if they, they want to place near to the airport, so easy to fly back to Semenanjung. Yeah, we we try to to accommodate all this, but then with the with all the posts are taken, then who are going to to be uh, working or place in the interior area? Because um, not to say it is not good, but mm -hmm. it is a good experience to to get more knowledge. Lah. Okay, for expect the unexpected. First thing for Endo, uh, you need to apply for your place. Okay, put your mindset which uh, state do you want. So. Okay, if you, you want to go to Sabah, you want to go to Sarawak, it's not only Kota Kinabalu or Kuching, okay? Because in uh, Sabah and Sarawak, there are a lot of other clinics uh, which is uh, uh, better and you can get more, uh, how to say, uh, open your eyes more in this area. So, when you apply the e-dentist, maybe you try to get the KK area, but then it's already full so why not just try to go for um to go to the interior area okay so i think if you ask your friends or your seniors they can share they can say they are doing doing well okay and just a tips if you are uh, in the dental clinics like what uh Kau mentioned just now to be good with your assistants okay just be okay for for personal experience just be humble and uh, keep a good attitude lah okay because first impression is the best because all all your dental staff your assistants your uh, dental technicians your drivers are the one the one will be working and assisting you because without them we can't we can't do any work at all because we need to travel we need our drivers we need to do the dentures to get our dentures done we need our dental technicians and also for nurses, dental nurses, they will help you in in clinicals in with toddlers as well. Yeah. So all, and also always observe, learn, and try to ask uh, which staff that, that is not familiar to you because in the um, study in in the college and also in the clinics, they might use different terms for equipment or materials. So we just need to get used to it. Ask, just ask around, ask your seniors, and uh, just to get familiarized. Lah. And also, always offer to assist your seniors if possible. So okay. easier for you to ask, you can uh, ask and just to get a, a hands-on experience lah for, yeah. for this one, for tips for, for those entering KKM soon. Yeah, I'd like to add, add to Jessel's one a little bit. Yeah, for those who are coming in, especially from PIDC, uh, when you enter, uh, because in KKM right now, you only have two postings. You do oral surgery or you do pediatrics dentistry. So these two is really important. So uh, uh, in uh, when PIDC graduates, they come out and get their posting, uh, they should be skilled uh, the basics when it comes to oral surgery. Like you should know your pharmacology really well because you'll be dealing with a lot of prescription. That's one thing. Secondly, a lot of, uh, of course, extraction and your minor surgical procedure would be the most common one would be wisdom tooth removal. So you need to practice that really well because you're going to be doing a lot of that those uh, in oral surgery. And uh, of course, you need to know your investigations, your blood investigation. I think that comes under, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, your, in your first year, actually, where you deal with uh, the clotting time and all these, that subject. All right. So uh, I think they need to be well worse in that because, you know, you don't want to go to the hospital and then seem like uh, you're not as good as the medical officers there. That's one more thing I want to talk about. Whenever a student comes in for attachment, because I used to be in oral surgery for four years. So whenever a student comes in for attachment, they, they always feel inferior to the medical officers. And I think that should be addressed. Come in con confidently. OK, um, the medical personnel, they have their own forte, which is the medical uh, section and everything. But us dental uh, personnel, we have our own forte as well, head, neck and oral. And ours is actually uh, branched out to even more uh, in depth uh, with ortho and perio and everything. So when you come in, 
just uh, you know you have to respect your own knowledge and and that is important and another thing i'd like to add is when when students come in uh, be willing to accept your your mistakes when you make mistakes because that is the only way you can improve if you don't accept your mistakes then you cannot improve like even me when i first came in i, I started off pretty rough but uh, because I didn't get a lot of help when I first came in from, from my seniors, because my seniors were all really good, you know, and I couldn't keep up with them. And, uh, but along the way, there were very kind people who helped me. And now, honestly, I, I do not need help anymore, but I just learn more and more from, from people. So that's how you, and when you become a senior, you just, uh, please remember, I have very good seniors. I think one of it is uh, Vinovan. I think he's he's watching or something. Vinovan's a very good senior. Okay, uh, uh, so basically, he shares his knowledge readily, and um, you know, always be humble when you've become a senior. That's very important. Don't yell at people and things like that. You know, that's how you improve your own self as well. So that, those are just some some small tips for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This, so this is the advices from the experienced dental officer. So um, maybe we can proceed to ask about how much is the time spent on every procedure in the dental clinic? Yeah, that is an interesting question because like typically for us now, I'm, a, I'm still a student. We typically, for example, for scaling, we will spend around 45 minutes to one hour just to treat one patient. But given the waiting list of six months in a KKM, how much time we really have while we are for every patient? Dr. Okay. Ati? Yes. For, for this, uh, I would say your, okay, you say 45 minutes in your uni, correct? For scaling and all. But uh, okay, it comes with experience. Basically, the longer you are experienced in uh, the workplace, uh, and then the, your feet, speed increases as well. So you get to do dental procedures pretty fast. So basically, right now with uh, AGP procedures uh, in the clinics, it's about an hour uh, per patient. So that includes uh, 30 minutes for treatment and another 30 minutes uh, is including, uh, uh, of course, the registration and everything and then disinfecting the room, airing out the room. Uh, also, we have to leave it for about 20 to 30 minutes. So uh, there, uh, whatever we can do in 30 minutes, we get it done. So scaling would be about uh, 10, 10 minutes, that's 10 minutes tops and then uh, we can squeeze in two or one filling in, in between and get things done. So that, that would actually, uh, of course, and then your oral hygiene instructions and things like that when you're done. So yeah, that's basically done within an hour, all of that. Dr. Jessa, how about your opinion? How okay, is your condition? You, when you mention, okay, when you mention about 45 minutes uh, when you're a student, because yeah, I agree, my time we, we were given 45 minutes as well. But then, come to think of it, it is, uh, that is your, lecturer the lecturer wants to see you tra uh, training you to to do the proper way uh, to do the proper way of scaling but then 45 minutes because you're waiting for them to come and look look at all the any any calculus left any any uh staining left so yeah as uh, as you enter the service uh, it comes with uh, experience like because as soon as the, the patient walks into the uh, dental surgery room and you start to ask questions uh, as the shift complaints, all of the all of your treatment plans are playing in your head already. You're already arranging okay what you're planning to do with this patient, this one, this one, this one, and that one. So uh, as soon as a uh, patient sits on the dental chair for his uh, scaling for his scaling appointment, just just make it about five to ten minutes so you can uh, not to say you are doing uh, not doing justice to the patient. You are just um, uh, treating the, the patient with your experience so uh, you can prepare prepare pre or her for the next uh, dental uh, dental treatment dental treatment that you have planned earlier so i might say five to ten minutes is sufficient enough because you are only given 30 minutes appointment time from uh, setting up of dental of this setting up of the dental and also cleaning of the dentistry preparing for the next patient <laughs> wow that is that is like unimaginable for us because now th we still spend a lot of time for each procedure okay and hopefully also, we can Harkins. get hopefully yes? we can get our things 
our procedure done faster than now after we enter the clinic as doctors now. Yeah. And also, Dr. Harvey, I remember before when we have some discussion, you, you mentioned to me that you work for Frontliner for Penang. And I think yes. this is a very good experience. Would you like to share it with our audience? Yeah, sure. I, I would I love to share it. Uh, so basically, um, I started off uh, volunteering at the uh, something called the COVID Fever Call Center. That was during the first uh, surge in cases uh, in March. Um, so, oh yes, we have a slideshow here. Let's let's look yeah. at the first picture. Vaccination, yes, my vaccination, uh, my duty as a vaccinator uh, just started yesterday, actually. So basically, uh, it's not as easy as it looks. Uh, there's a way of mixing uh, the vaccine. There's a way of storing it. There's a way of even charting. And in a day, about only eight vials come out. And that eight vials will be used, per vial will be used by six uh, patients. So currently, we are still in the first phase of uh, frontliners being vaccinated. Uh, uh, right now, it's all the police officers and the balance of the uh, medical officers and data officers which haven't gotten uh, vaccinated yet. We're going to end the first phase soon and we're going to go into the second phase, which is in about to start in April, 8th of April. And I think the next, uh, right now, uh, currently, we are still using the Pfizer uh, uh, vaccine. Pfizer. And then I think, yeah. Next would be uh, Sinovac, from what I've uh, spoken with them uh, yesterday. So, um, yeah, so this is my uh, experience as a vaccinator. I think we can move on to the next slide. Swabbing, yes, swabbing was during the second uh, resurgence of cases, yeah, which was during, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was September till November. Yeah, I was in the swabbing team from end of September till November. Uh, so this uh, was my uh, swabbing at the, I went, we went around, there were nine uh, in a total, sorry, total of 11 of us only dental officers who volunteered. Actually, we volunteered to go to Sabah to help Jessel's place because a lot of my friends in Sabah were saying that the condition was uh, really bad and they needed help. And of course, uh, so, so something just told me that we had to go and help and we just wanted to help. Uh, our country and our people so but unfortunately the plan got halted so because Penang the cases in Penang uh, were rising as well yeah. and therefore uh, uh, we started off uh, doing uh, swabbing at the Penang International uh, Dental Airport at the international arrival and then if you move on to the next slide so yeah that's me in a PPE and of course in the airport the swabbing uh, room is actually really high tech it's equipped, it's like a chamber, you know, a glass chamber. You only put in your hands inside and then get the swabbing done. You don't even have contact with the patient. And once it's done, they would actually on the UV light and the filter, the air filter and everything to get it, uh, to get the sanitization and airflow and everything going on. Yeah, so it was really high tech in the, yeah, that's the chamber behind us. All right, wow. that, that's my friend at the, on the, on the left left of the, of the screen is actually Dr. Chong Wee Jian. He's from uh, Periodontic Mandin in Penang as well. One of my good friends, also very active in swabbing. Uh, on the right side is actually a, a medical officer whom we just met actually on that particular day. Uh, we can actually go to the next one. Right, yeah. this was actually in Jalan Perak, one of the main swabbing uh, clinics in Penang actually. So in a day, there can be about a hundred patients coming in so we have to be there ready wearing the tie wax there from nine o'clock in the morning until about one one o'clock and then we take a break and then we're back there at two to five getting things done so uh, this is how it looks like so as you can see we are fully equipped with our ppe and then we have sort of like the glass uh, barrier in front of us to prevent infection and everything like that so this was very tiring at this place. It was really tiring because it was also very hot. We were under the hot sun. Time. Yeah, under the astronaut suit inside, yeah. we are stressing. We are typically and, like taking a bath. And you get super hungry after you're done because you've been perspiring so much, you know? And yeah. uh, this is actually uh, another, um, this was, it is actually, it's like a tiny hut that was built uh, using uh, certain components special uh, uh, sort of like material uh, that they've built it to keep the the hut uh, cool inside as we get swabbing done. 
So we've uh, done a lot of uh, politicians and everything. We've done their swabbing in here. It's pretty private, this closed area. So yes, it's nice. Uh, they have also, it's air conditioned as well, this one. Uh, this is also in Jalan Pera. This is where we get uh, to our donning. Uh, donning means when you put on your PPE, it's called donning, yeah. If you want to look more on the procedures on donning and doffing, you can actually go on YouTube. There's actually a very clear video on it. Yep. So um, next, uh, these are, yes, my teammates. Uh, uh, the other two officers at the side are actually Dr. Shekin and Dr. Another one, I can't really remember. Both of them were from college. Actually, they were the only two volunteers from College Pergigian in Penang. Right. And ah, this this one is in Batu Mawung, Penang. This was, uh, this was a very big number. There were 3,000 people to screen. 3,000 people. So, the, oh. the, yes, 3,000, uh, including foreigners as well. This was done at uh, one of the uh, factory uh, industrial area where they had a lot of foreigners coming in. So, uh, one thing uh, that you can see during, I, I don't have many pictures because most of the time I don't touch my, my phone when I go swabbing. So, this was taken by somebody else. Uh, so, what happened at Batu Maung was, sorry, can we go back to the previous slide? Yeah, so Batu Mawang was you get a lot of foreigners and uh, in during this time you actually see that a lot of uh, Malaysians actually come together to even uh, do uh, and help the uh, migrants in this country as well, foreigners and all. There were no biasness, there were no racial bias, uh, you know, when it came to treatment and things like that. And that really made me happy to do the job that we're doing because you really saw unity among Malaysians and other races during this time at Batu Maung. It was very crucial, actually. And also, uh, during this time, after the swabbing, a few days after going for swabbing here, I was actually uh, contra I contracted the disease, actually, a few days after. Yeah. But it wasn't due to this place. I mean, it happened, so it was after this uh, session. And the next picture, I think uh, this was a different task, actually. Actually, this was in uh, March when uh, COVID, uh, the, the cases were really high. The first wave, actually, in March 2020. So we were called to help the medical team uh, in a call center to help uh, deal with the calls and everything. So when you say calls, it's just not people calling us and complaining. It's about us answering a lot of questions. And basically, we have to ally with a lot of departments. The airport, we have to ally with KKM, what's the latest guideline? We have to ally with the foreign ministers and everything. What's the latest guideline for uh, immigrants, uh, for foreign workers who are working here? Uh, what's the latest SOPs to be done in clinics? Where to get treatment? How to get treatment? Everything. And we had to read the newspaper every single day because we need to know the latest information. So this was at the COVID fever call center in Penang. It was amazing experience. I worked uh, beside me, uh, actually, St. John Ambulance uh, personnel. They were all volunteers. They were teachers, mathematics teachers. They were just staff nurses. They were engineers. Iris, all of them came together to help. They were amazing people. Really, they are. So a lot of people don't see the behind the scenes, but these are, I have very few pictures, and these are all behind the scenes, actually. So that's, that's about my experience. Yes, I'm very happy to be part of it. And I think uh, for the KDC students next, you know, if you got your, you guys go out there, uh, you know, just contribute. Whatever skills you have, contribute to your country, contribute to society, because that's actually what we do. We want to, for those who are interested in the public health, dental public health and public health fraternity, you want to be part of it, this is what it takes. This is what you got to do. You got to go out there and make a difference to our country. And we all did, all of us. Me, Jessel, you, Zishin, Kokhao, all those people who are watching, everyone made a difference. Everyone played their part. And I hope uh, you know, the cases will go down. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. Get over it. yeah. That is very inspiring, Dr. Harati. Yeah. 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 It's, I think it's very challenging, but at the same time, you get a lot of rewards for servicing for the nation, servicing for the people. Also, yeah, from, okay, the so sharing, us, from the sharing, yeah. we also can see not only the med, uh, medical professional, the dentist can contribute as a frontliner. Like Dr. Harati mentioned just now, uh, no matter you are an engineer, you are an accountant, you are a teacher, you can also contribute to the COVID uh, COVID war in Malaysia as well. 
So then, uh, we we have seen the condition in Penang. Maybe now we can proceed to the condition in Sabah, Dr. Jason. Okay. Um, nice sharing, huh, Harati? Okay, for, Thank you. For the situation in Sabah, for myself, I have experienced um, firsthand on to be becoming frontliners lah. Okay, uh, back in October 2, 2020, uh, the medical side asked assistance from our side, from the dental side, when during this uh, sudden increase in COVID-19 cases, uh, the starting of October last year, which is right after the Sabah general election. Okay, some were deployed to hospitals and some were deployed to the quarantine centers. Myself, I was deployed to CPRCKK, Kota Kinabalu, for contact tracing, as well as uh, going to the field for taking, um, taking swaps. But then, the challenge in Sabah is, most of them, I mean not all, most of them are uh, undocument, undocumented individuals. So, when we want to get their data or when we try to contact them, they will usually, some will uh, cooperate with us, some will just ignore and, and will simply shout, shout at us or just ignore us, ignore our calls and so yeah, in case, as you can see in this photo, yeah, with taking me and my team uh, as a medical assistant from the medical side, uh, we did some uh, swap taking in one of the houses in uh, Ireland. Uh, can you proceed to the next next slide? As you can see here, yeah, we are just me in the Tyvek suit because you, you can't see it. <laughs> you can't see us because all of us are wearing the same thing and you can't even identify us. Uh, next next photo. Okay, I just want to bring you to uh, to this area. This is in Pulau Gaya. Pulau Gaya, uh, most of them um, is like 50-50. Uh, some having um, uh, identification, some not having identification. So we need to travel all the way from the mainland, which is in the KK, KKJT, to this area, which takes about, about 10 15 to 20 minutes and we need to find those who are positive cases or close contact to the positive cases so that we can take their swab test so we can uh, separate them or isolate them from those things here because when you see this area this area is actually a, a very populated very dense area and uh, and if you can see from their lifestyle, and I don't think they are they can really adhere properly to the SOP. Can you proceed to the next picture? Mm -hmm. Next slide. So yeah, this one also is uh, is in, in one of the squatter area in KK. Uh, we are taking we are taking we are setting up our COVID COVID swap test station in the one of the hill hillside area. So it's a bit. Uh, basically, it's every we can we we can do this everywhere in the hillside, in the squatter area, in the island, under the house, uh, beside the beach, beside the river, and everything. So as so that we want to identify them, we can isolate them, and we can uh, make Sabah. Uh, we can bring down the COVID cases in Sabah. You can proceed to the next photo, please. So we are so, not yeah, only it, waiting for the patient to come to us, but we are actively yeah, we are, going out. We are going to the patient because we want to avoid patients coming to the uh, swap swap center because we want to reduce their movement. Because most of them not having transportation, they are taking grabs or yeah, they're taking grabs. So we want to reduce further uh, contacts. So as you can see in this photo, this is in Pulau Gaya can see we are like try to avoid all the muddy muddy areas all the rubbish here and there because yeah this is uh, how we work like uh, when Ma Harati mentioned about we are working in the air conditioned space my condition here is different we are working under the hot sun oh. we are working under the hot sun yeah because under the hot sun with the Tyvek suit and working working house by house looking for this particular person looking for this particular family and 
the big challenge is if they are un undocumented, they have no IC. The moment they heard is coming looking for them, they will straight away uh, run away. Run wow. away. They will run away because they're scared that we will um, hand them to the off to the police officer. This is a different thing because they thought they will get uh, get caught by the police because no, we are trying. We are just trying to help you. We are trying to isolate you. We don't want you to to meet people here and there. So yeah, this is uh, one of the houses also in in the Pulau. So yeah, again next. Uh, this is uh, this is in the jetty area. We are ready for doffing after uh, after our ex our job in the Pulau because basically we need to wear this from mm -hmm. the jetty or from the boat. And walk, walk all over on the on the bridges in in the in the island there and back to this jetty with our direction can you uh, proceed next and this is my team uh, our team uh, which are doing mass screening in the KK Kota Kinabalu fish market uh, we are uh, taking swaps about 8,000 8,000 workers 8,000 workers there yes because uh, Yes, because this uh, KK market, uh, KK fish market is just right next or near to the pulau that is we are actively going there taking swaps. So we we can see that I, we don't want the workers there working with having having this uh, COVID nineteen uh, positive with COVID nineteen. It can uh, get to the next. I just want to touch one more thing before I end my sharing. Ah, this is how we travel. This is how we take swaps and finding their house because we need to go by boats and asking where are you, where do, do they stay, and those who are staying uh, in the pool in the island area, we need to climb up, <laughs> climb up from our boats to the to the house. And also, okay, this one, I, okay, this photo. Can you see the next this photo? When we have, when we try to some of the bridges in in this area they are you can see the width of the bridge so when you walk here you need to be be careful uh, or unless you end Take up a swim. <laughs> <laughs> you'll end up in the in the sea like swimming swimming with the fishes and <laughs> rubbish so yeah, <laughs> yeah you need to you need to balance yourself and balance yourself together with your uh, with your with your kids your swap kit with your with all your storage thing lah. so this is the biggest challenge in work uh working as a deployed as a frontliner or assistance in the covid 19 uh, in sabah despite all the all the contribution we done to the society and to the people i heard that there are still people having some sort of prejudice or they have some misconception about us dentists. And I believe you have uh, something to share with us, Dr. Harati. Uh, yeah, I, actually, it's a, a topic that's very close to, to me, my heart because um, I think a lot of people, they talk about COVID-19 and everything, but they brush aside uh, social stigma. So social stigma is actually uh, something that is very hard to deal with especially if people do not have the proper support or the experience dealing with a lot of criticism and things like that. So when I was diagnosed, of, of course, I was at the receiving end of a lot of uh, social stigmatization, not just me, even my sister, who was also positive COVID. Uh, we were both in the health line, actually. So when it came to that, uh, a lot of uh, already the patients would usually feel guilty when, uh, uh, you know, you contract this, of course, because you're worried about your friends and family who might get infected as well and it's not something that someone asked for it's something that happens even after you follow all the SOPs that have uh, been uh, advised and everything so it's something unavoidable uh, for certain people especially people like uh, us who work in the uh, front line you know it's part of our job you can't say I'm scared to go to the front line I want to stay at home you must do uh, your duty when it comes when the time comes and that involves uh, this kind of risk which is getting infected as well and so um, when that happened, a lot of people, I think uh, people are afraid of the disease. And that's why they come up with a lot of comments, 
uh, hurtful comments or they come up with uh, a lot of uh, twisted stories or versions of it on, on their own. And, and to avoid all this, uh, during my time in the hospital when I heard all this, of course, I was I was sad. I think at least once people would cry in the hospital. <laughs> it's a normal thing to cry, you know, at least once, once you know. And uh, during uh, my hospitalization, uh, what happened was I, I felt all that negativity coming towards me and I took it all and I asked myself, how do I change this to something positive? So I took that experience. I wrote an article to New Straight Times where I intend, my only intention was to actually create awareness and let people know our the plight of uh, frontliner and their families and what they go through and everything. And that, that article actually uh, helped a lot of people understand the situation frontliners were going through. Uh, that includes uh, depression, you know, feeling guilty, feeling stressed out, these kind of things. And when it comes to social stigma, I think most of the time it's because uh, some uh, or certain uh, amount of people, they do not understand the disease itself. The fear comes from lack of knowledge. You don't read about something. You will never know how it happens or how it affects someone. And you, you, then you tend to blame people about it. Uh, so people who actually read about the disease, how it spreads, why it spreads, then they would know that it's something that, uh, you know, so micro, so micro, you know, something that the, the virus itself is uh, only slightly bigger than your Zika virus. The Zika virus is really small and your COVID-19 virus is about uh, 0.5 microns. Like it builds uh, like a hundred, you need a hundred of it to form a strand of hair. So that's how small it is. So the chances of someone getting infected is really high. So a lot of people, when they don't read, they don't know this. But, you know, it's uh, our duty as uh, dental officers. And if you're in the public dental health uh, fraternity, then it's our duty to actually create awareness to, to let people know that is why, um, of course, after the incident and everything, uh, we, we go out there, we share numbers where people can actually get help from. Uh, there's a number by Mercy and the Psychiatric Department. Um, uh, for for actually uh, by uh, Mercy and Psychiatric KKM, there's a hotline actually. If people want to get help, you can call zero three two nine three five nine nine three five, or you can actually WhatsApp zero one four three two two three three nine two. All right, all these uh, hotlines that were given previously and and, and the one right now is uh, they all work uh, from eight to eight a.m. to five p.m. So if you know anyone that need help, you can actually call the number. Or you can call Dr. Jessel for help. <laughs> because I'm sure he has some experience helping uh, some people being in the HQ, right? Yeah. <laughs> maybe yeah, next time when I'm having I trouble with my when I'm having trouble with my exam, maybe I can call the call the number also. <laughs> <laughs> sure, just call, just call any one of us. So I, if I may add on for on Dr. Haratis uh, just now. Uh, so yeah, the mental health issue relating to COVID nineteen is is real lah. You can't take it light. And if those any one of you, any of your friends or your colleagues uh, experiencing uh, issues regarding this, just try talk to them, uh, give them comfort. Because when uh, I was in CPR CKK, when I did contact tracing, I'm using my own personal number, handphone number, to call them and ask where are you. Who are you with? And also, when I go to the field, when I go to their house, I need I need them to send uh, to send their location to me. So when I do the swab test, and yeah, they are, all of them will save my number. Mm -hmm. Suddenly at twelve a.m., one a.m., two a.m. in the morning, they will call me or they will WhatsApp me. They will ask, Doctor, how's my how's my test result? Doctor, why why I uh, get affected with uh, COVID nineteen because I'm at home only. I didn't go anywhere. A lot of a lot of these questions are uh, at odd hours. Sometimes at five a.m. they will already they call me, doctor. My is my results out, doctor. Is my results out? I I cannot sleep. I cannot I cannot do anything waiting for my results. So yeah, this type of um, questions we need to uh, comfort or entertain them because yeah because if they are. Yeah, keep on thinking about their test results or why they have been quarantined because they are COVID nineteen patients. Uh, we just need to give um, give them a hand lah, just comfort them lah. Yeah, not to say that uh, okay, I'm, I settle with my with my job. Okay, it's up to you because the patient is yeah lah, 
you are still you are still treating them you are still watching them until they get uh, until they settle their quarantine quarantine period so, yeah, so yeah. for those for those patients who had infected with COVID-19, uh, please feel free to approach yourself to the professional so they can help you to tackle with your emotional problem. You don't have to worry too much about your disease. Yeah. They will help you. Yeah. To our audience, please note down the Mercy and Psychiatric KKM hotline or you can actually Google it online. And don't feel shy to approach for your to solve your own issue. Lah. It's never... You shouldn't feel shy to get treated. Yeah, yeah it's not a physical, thing. yeah, physical condition, even your mental condition. Okay, so now we let's have a look. Let's have There's a look at our. There's one more question. Uh, yeah. From the audience. Mm -hmm. the so from, the from 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 Ravi Minan. My friend was national champion for Inawasi, overfill her logbook, and had very good work. Ethic. Basically, uh, I think he mean that he, one of his, his friend is very excellent in the performance, but she didn't get absorbed into the government. But another friend is not as good as the previous friend, but the friend get absorbed. Why? Why is it happened? Maybe Doctor Jesso or Doctor Harati can answer this. Right. Okay, so now if you look, uh, during my time, there's a different program. It's called FIDO. Right now, it's called an NDOC program. It's a one-year compulsory service plus another two years of contract. So your two years of contract, if you resign, uh, if you, re you can choose to resign during these two years or you can continue uh, working in KKM and contributing and everything. And uh, recently, during the pandemic, there's been uh, extra, uh, for those who did not quit, Usually, the results will come out six months before their second contract ends. For those who did not quit, they will be offered an interview based on your performance as an overall for the uh, first two years. So your first two years, the performance actually depends on um, your, your logbook. There's a logbook for the primary uh, for uh, for the primary. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, treatments done in the clinic for uh, itself, your dental clinic itself, and then you have a logbook for pediatrics. Uh, pediatrics dentistry and then you have another logbook for oral surgery these two places you go for attachment one month and one month lah, each and what happens is so basically in 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 your clinics you need to know uh, how to uh, do uh, promotional activities like uh, you know all your talks uh, those kind of uh, interactive activities that you do with your patients let's say a dental coloring contest or a dental quiz or maybe give talks like this and then, uh, of course, it depends on your clinical work, how you do fissure sealant, whether you do it well or not. Uh, and then extractions, uh, management of uh, basic emergency uh, and, and things like that. And then when you go to oral surgery, of course, um, uh, what happens is uh, they would uh, uh, evaluate you on your skills, your surgical skills. That means your MOS, your suturing, uh, uh, medical emergencies as well, on-call cases, how you manage them. You will be doing tagging. You wouldn't be alone, so don't worry. But do always do your best and then followed by pediatrics. Okay, same thing as well. They will evaluate you. And then on top of that, you have your SKT, your Sasaran Kerja Tahunan. That means uh, all those, uh, uh, sum up of all those patients that you've done in, in the past two years and how well you have performed. So when you're, when you're there, it's not only about doing your clinical work. Uh, you have to uh, take part in programs as well. Okay, there's a lot of promotional activities out there. Uh, be it with KKM or sometimes uh, outside of KKM, maybe you are involved with the Institute for Guru and Pelat uh, Latihan Guru, okay? Uh, with the teaching, you know, sector out there, they, they will collaborate with KKM, they'll come up with uh, certain activities, you'll know, take part in that. You know, if you're good uh, with technology, make a video, do banners, do posters, mm -hmm. do those infographics, you know, some of your young people are really good at those. So, so use that skill, put it out there, show that because KKM needs people like this, you know, no more old school, no more writing on papers and stuff like that. It's the new era, it's the, you know, it's the era of digitalization. So use that skills. Mm -hmm. And then, um, of course, uh, uh, perform well, be in good terms with your uh, colleagues and all. Even if you are in a bad, uh, you know, uh, place or something, maybe you feel it's a bad place, you can't work properly in that uh, setting or something, don't worry because 
nothing bad lasts forever. It will change. You might get, you can ask for a transfer, you might get a transfer to a nearby other clinic or somebody new comes to that clinic, they become your best friend and everything. You know, anything can change, so don't give up, you know. Maybe after one year you feel it's so tough, don't give up. Okay, keep doing your best. And of course, uh, after that, uh, you'll be evaluated by your young menjaga, which is your boss uh, in your clinic itself. And then those uh, results will go up further to the district level where your senior district officer will also evaluate you for all the performance. If you do well, you will get a good remark and everything. You will be given a chance. And then further on to the Timbalan Pengaras office where Jessel works, uh, those kind, the HQ and all. It will go up there and then they will see how so basically, if you get involved in a very big project, uh, something that's international, you know, uh, like right now, this PIDC talk is a uh, whole of uh, Penang, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it? It's a state level thing, is it? Uh, Kok Hao? Some, uh, somewhat, uh, because it's Facebook Live. <laughs> right. Facebook Live. So, uh, so yes, basically, yes, your involvement, uh, how, how far you go and everything. So the more you put out there, the more they know you. So it's easy for them to, you know, tell, oh, this uh, Zishin is the one that did this thing and, uh, you know, always on live on Facebook and everything. So, you know, we put a nice good remark there. She got nice good skills. If, you, if your skills are only confined to the clinics, nobody will know you, correct or not? Huh. Yeah. You need to put yourself out there. And one more thing is, um, of course, be in, in, in uh, be respectful to others and everything like that, you know? So, and uh, to those who, uh, whose question was this just now? Uh, by who? Uh, Mr. Ravi Menon. Uh, yes, Ravi Menon. Okay, so Ravi, Ravi Menon. So if, if you do not get selected, if you do not get selected, it's not the end of the world, okay? There is still a lot more opportunities out there. Some of your seniors can tell you how their experience is in the private sector. I have friends, colleagues, huh? same batchmates who are earning five digits right now out there. Okay, some of them have specialized in aesthetics. They're doing so well. All right. So there's so many other opportunities out there. So don't give up. It's not the end of the world. If you don't get it, keep going. Prove to people that you can do it out there. We, we did, even if you get it, even if you don't get it, you are you, you are special and you can keep going and doing what you do best out there. So don't give up. All right, Ravi Man, and I hope uh, that answers your question, yeah? Yep. Just a, right. the doctor, yeah, Jasper, do you want try, to Yeah, I, I uh, add something. For at our level, at our uh, Pajabat TPK NG level, we will try, I mean, we are, uh, we went through for all of this, uh, all of these applications, all of your achievements and everything, we try to help where we can. Maybe we can see there's a lack of time. We try to we contact, we contact the supervisors, we try to contact the uh, young menjaga in the clinic. We ask, uh, are there any activities that she or he might have joined but forgot, forget to update in the uh, in, in the list? Lah. So we, we try to, to do all this so that we uh, you get the maximum requirements so that you can get absorbed into the uh, service. But then all these uh, depends on the higher ups again. Lah. Because from our side, after us, we will send to the uh, Bahagian Sumber Manusia, KKM. Then they will go through all these and they will go another level. That is the Suruhan Jaya Perkhidmatan Awam. This side, from their side, they will only finalize if you get absorbed or not. So basically, all of us from each level, we try to to do our best to help those really really want to stay and really try their hard to to stay the uh, the government lah. So yeah, that's from me. All right. So now I can see. I hope they answer your questions, Mr. Ravi Menon. Now, uh, we are before we end today's show. Let us move on to the to the last one topic that we wanted to discuss for today, which is the journey from a boy or a girl to doctors. So, Dr. Harati or Dr. Zeso, do you have any tips or tricks or advice for the freshmen? Because we have some senior who just got their posting recently. So- I'll let, doc let Dr. Harati start lah because she's my oh, senior. <laughs> okay, sorry, what was the question okay. again? Tips and tricks for the freshmen. All right, yeah. I think I mentioned before, yeah, when you are going out there, when you just get posted, always be fluid. Fluid means you can adapt to any situation. Be it you go to Penang or you go to 
oh, Sarawak. Like I'm from KL. I've been in Penang for seven years already. It's been a long time. All right. So it, but it doesn't matter. You make the best out of things. Always be willing to uh, accept your mistakes and always uh, try and learn new things as you go on. Don't confine yourself uh, to the same dental procedures. You know, try to do something out of the box. Try to be different. You know, challenge yourself every time. If it's difficult, go and do it. If you don't know how to do it, ask your seniors how you got to do it. All right. Mm. There are people who will definitely be willing to help you. And also, if you like to, if if you can't uh, contribute in clinic, then maybe you can do it out outside of uh, of uh, clinic uh, days and things like that. You know, I think our senior, one of them, uh, I think he has a YouTube channel called Gigi Han. Uh, I'm I'm sure some of you all have watched it before, where he creates a lot of awareness and he, he compares this and that, and it's very interesting to watch actually. So. Uh, Han is actually one of the very first batches in uh, from PIDC as well. Um, so you can see uh, there that he has been imp he improvised what he can do and everything. And of course, always be humble, always be respectful to those who are. Uh, don't don't forget the people who help you when you have become a senior. Don't forget your lecturers and, and things like that. You know. So those are tips and tricks from me. And of course, one more thing about uh, working in the government that I feel is really good is we get to do so many different cases and try out so many different methods and treatment plans. And, you know, as you get uh, not older, as your experience uh, increases, you will come up with treatment plans just like that, you know. And it, it would actually, uh, you know, uh, basically, you are more independent as you as you go when it comes to the government sector. Um, of course, if you want to know about more on the private sector, then you have to consult a person who's working in the private sector. But I can vouch for the government sector. There's a lot to do and a lot to try out. Uh, Dr. Jessel, maybe you can take it from here. Okay, okay. For tips and tricks for yeah, from from our boy to our girl. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, always be humble and keep a good attitude and be nice to to all your colleagues, lah, especially your those who are working directly with you, not under you. We are we are working together. They are not working under you. So keep that in mind. We are all the same because without them, we can't do anything. Because they are uh, all these uh our assistants, they are playing a big role in our dental treatment as well. And always observe and try to learn new stuff from the seniors. And also when you are seniors, there are more, there are new batch of endo coming and try be a good senior and guide them. Lah. That's the, the how, how, how it goes. Lah. We are working in hand in this government because when you're in a government, uh, basically we are all the same. No seniors, no juniors. We are all the same. Just that, just let's say, if you are get posted in somewhere, you might be the senior for that area, and so yeah, yeah you need to uh, get in touch with uh, everything and try to to be confident in everything what you do lah. And for uh, uh, for the private to compare the challenges in private and also in the government, they have their own challenges. It's very subjective. It depends on you, whether you like to uh, work in the private side or you like to work in the government. Um, they have their own advent pros and cons. Lah. So it's up to you. Um, it's on your own. Lah. You, you, you like to uh, explore more new stuff or you like to mm, further your study and stay in the government. So it's all, all up to you. Just that for your first year, you just need to get all your quotas done and try to uh, keep a good attitude with everyone. Lah. Yeah, that's the rest for me. So rather than per se, always be nice to everyone else. I think the, the, the core values here is we are working together. Yeah, not work under for, for someone. Working together yeah. and try to be nice to everyone else. So I and think do are, what you do in yes. your place. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. Yes. Do so, what makes you happy. Mm -hmm. And one more thing. Yes, I want to add for those who, uh, you know, you want to specialize or something. Don't be shy. If you have a certain skills, if your skills skew towards surgical, go join the oral surgery team. Talk to the specialist. Find out a way to join. You know, and uh, for those who who are like me, 
uh, sometimes I, I have two uh, different set of skills. I had the surgical and I also had, uh, I also was interested in admin and everything, management and all. And I, and so, yeah. So, uh, so basically right now I'm in uh, trying to, you know, uh, further do my attachment in public health and everything. So if you have an interest, go after it. Don't just wait for people to open a door for you. That rarely happens. All right. So show your skills out there. Know what you want. And if you don't want, also it's okay. You want to be just a general dentist. It's okay. If that's uh, if that makes you happy, that's all right. That's that's good. Really good as well. All right. Yeah. If you want something, you have to ask for it. I think that's mm, what the go uh, after it. Yeah. To tell us. All right. So I think we are approaching the end for today's show. So if you guys have any more questions that you don't like. Not for now, maybe in later. Do you have any question you want to ask? You can also put it in the comment and we'll get back to you soon. Also, I would like to thank you, Dr. Harati and Dr. Zeso, for joining our session today. It's a really good sharing. We learned a lot of things from both of you. And thank you, doctors. And I, we also wish you successful in your career. And the thing, do you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, so uh, for the audience, if you want to know more, or you, if you want to get more information about this, the webinar, the talk show, or alumni talk like this, you can subscribe our PIDC Facebook, uh, YouTube, and also follow our PIDC Instagram, and also our PVC Instagram. Yeah, so PVC is our students' uh, initiative to create a platform for the student to explore about virtual world, especially during the situation where the pandemic has restricted us from carrying out a lot of the physical activities that we used to have. So it's a really good platform and I hope that we can make our names be heard by all the, all the people in the, in the dental society. So please help uh, support us, come and like our page, all right? So I think that's all for today. Once again, thank you for all the audience and thank you for Dr. Harati and Dr. Zeso. Okay, we like my end. Mm. I, I add thank you, thank you to Gokau and Zixian for, for this session. Lah. And also, uh, especially thank you to Dr. Lahari who approached me via WhatsApp, asked ask me if I'm interested to join. And to all the viewers out there, uh, thank you. I've been reading all the comments. Uh, thank you for the kind words and encouragement. Thank you. Terima kasih and ketohwadan. Yeah, I'd like to say thank you as well to Dr. Uh, Lahari, Dr. Ajay and the PIDC uh, staffs as well for giving us an opportunity. Also to uh, Kokao and Zizin, thank you for planning this and doing our posters which looks really incredible. Good job. And uh, of course to all those people who are watching, thanks for also watching, asking us you know, interactive questions and everything. And uh, lastly to my seniors as well, thank you everyone. Uh, have a nice day. All right, I think that's it. That's it for today's show and stay tuned for more. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. Have Bye. a good weekend. Thank you, everyone.